Before the Age of Men, the giants ruled uncontested. And before even their prodigious forms did rise, the dragons held domain. Mighty tyrants of all their eyes would be set upon. However, before the draconic powers took root, there were others. Monsters, in the truest sense of the word. They held no kingdoms, forged no bonds, built no society, and worshipped no gods. They simply lived and died by the one rule they held close. The strong survive, the weak do not. Creatures that would send anything you've ever read about in a dusty tome or ancient scrolling recoiling back to whatever crack in the world it crawled out of. We should be so lucky that they do not smear us from the ground we stand upon. This world does not belong to us. We merely wait on borrowed time until its rightful rulers should wake from their slumber. And they will. Oh, they will. Hello and welcome to a very special episode of Monster of the Week, the show where we dig into D&D's past and bring monsters from old books and dragon magazine to light to use in your 5th edition D&D campaign. My name is Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, and as I mentioned, today's episode is something quite unlike anything I think I've ever done on the channel before. Today, we're going to be talking about the impossible, gargantuan creatures that live in the far reaches of the multiverse. Kaiju. For those of you unaware what a kaiju actually is, it is a monster of civilization-destroying proportions. Something so grand and vast that it could wipe an entire kingdom off the map if it so chose to do. The classic example of this, of course, being Godzilla. Now the idea of kaiju appearing in Dungeons and Dragons is not necessarily a new idea. In fact, there's one in the 5th edition monster manual. The Tarasque is very much a kaiju. I mean, just think about it. It's a nigh unstoppable force that slumbers under the ground waiting to be awakened. And should it rise up to the land above, it will wreak absolute havoc on everything it comes across. And one of the biggest giveaways that the Tarasque is in fact a kaiju is the fact that it's a unique creature. When the book actually talks about the Tarasque, it doesn't say when a Tarasque makes a bite attack, the following things happen. It says when THE Tarasque makes a bite attack, the following things happen. It's also made very clear if you dig into its lore and history that this is indeed a unique creature. It's not a Tarasque, it's THE Tarasque. There's one of them. Upon seeing it off in the distance, people would not scream, oh gods, it's a Tarasque. They would scream, it's Tarasque, there he is. And all kaiju, fortunately for the mortals that walk the earth, are indeed unique. Every kaiju is distinct from another, there's only one of them, and while they may share some physical characteristics, they are all their own weird one-off creature that evolution somehow led to and then cut itself off. Or whatever your backstory of choice happens to be for the particular kaiju in your world. And that's what really makes kaiju fascinating, is each one has their own personality, their own name, their own fantastical powers that kind of makes them similar to designing a D&D character. While there might be some similarities, they are all individuals. So how could I go about converting such a monster to 5th edition if there's almost infinite possibilities of what this creature could indeed look like? Well... I didn't. What I did was I followed the lead of Dragon Magazine issue 289, the one that first presents Kaiju to us, and I made a template. So what you will find in the description below is no mere stat block for a Kaiju. It is a template of stats and abilities that can be applied to any beast or monstrosity that you find in the monster manual or otherwise, thus turning them into a gargantuan earth-shattering monster. Down there you'll also find three example kaiju that I created using this template just to kind of show what you can do with it. So what I did for the first one was I created a warhorse kaiju named Ebonsari because I just wanted to see what kind of ridiculous monster I could make with such an unassuming creature. And that one I think actually turned out to be my favorite. 
you'll also find Diablatra, who is based off of the giant wasp from the Monster Manual. And of course, Presagira, who is based off of the giant crab that is also found in the Monster Manual. Now these three monsters, you are of course welcome to use the stat blocks there if you happen to like them, but I also created them mainly for the purpose of showing what this template is capable of and what it looks like when you take a regular mundane creature and bring it up to the level of godhood amongst monsters. So today, I'm going to go over just what these creatures might be capable of in battle, of course, kind of run through the process of actually creating one for yourself, and of course, go over some plot hooks and some fantastic ways that we can make use of kaiju in our 5th edition D&D worlds, because there are a lot of them and I'm really excited to talk about using kaiju in D&D. But first things first, pick a god and pray, because it's time for... So the first step to creating a kaiju of your own is basically picking out the creature you want to base it on. I recommend just flipping through your favorite 5th edition book, it might be the Monster Manual, Volo's Guide, or some other kind of independent product. Maybe it's a folder with a bunch of monsters made by a guy on YouTube. And just try to imagine what each of these creatures, the beasts and monstrosities, might look like as a kaiju. And some of them might be a little bit more difficult to turn into a giant monster than others, but if I was able to turn a horse into a kaiju, I don't think there's really anything in the monster manual that's off limits. So the key here is to just really let your imagination go wild. Maybe you want to take a displacer beast and make that into a kaiju, which of course would be terrifying because it would retain its doubling effect that makes it harder to hit. Or maybe you want to make a literal flying spaghetti monster and turn a flump into a kaiju. Whatever floats your boat, whatever makes your mind start to think and imagine, just run with it. And the first actual physical change we're going to make to this creature is it becomes gargantuan sized. All kaiju are huge, it's gargantuan, you can make it as big as you want it to be. These are creatures that literally shatter mountains and decimate cities in a night. And when it comes to actually doing battle with a kaiju, they're all going to be totally different. But one thing they will mostly have in common is natural attacks. So in the template there are specific rules for how to create a natural attack and what type of natural attack it will have, but basically if it has claws or hands, it's going to have a claw attack, if it has a tail, it gets a tail attack, and so on and so forth. And like I mentioned, any natural abilities it already has are going to remain. So when I did the transformation for the giant wasp kaiju, it retained its sting ability that does a crazy amount of poison damage as it's ramped up to kaiju levels. And the Warhorse, of course, retains its charge and hoof attacks, which kind of seems silly for a Warhorse. It's not that big of a threat, but on a kaiju scale battle, that's actually terrifying. <laughs> Now I won't get super into depth here, but there are a bunch of calculations in there that will tell you what its armor class should be and how much hit points it should have, that kind of stuff. But once you're done kind of doing the legwork of all the mathematics that go into making it a massively higher CR creature, you're going to get to pick some fantastical abilities and this is where the creature becomes really unique. Basically there's a list of many different attacks and abilities that the creature might have and it's up to you to choose four of them that you think would fit your kaiju. So if it has wings, maybe it gets the ability to create hurricane force winds that occupy an area and knock everyone prone and make ranged attacks against it impossible for a certain amount of time. Or perhaps you give it a breath weapon like a laser that shoots off a mile in one direction that decimates everything in its path. Whatever traits you choose, each one of them will help kind of craft the identity of your kaiju. For example, as I was creating Ebensari, the Warhorse kaiju, uh, I gave it the regeneration ability, which allows it to regain hit points similarly to how a troll works. And that got me kind of thinking, maybe the theme for this kaiju is that it's very tough, it's hard to kill. Not necessarily armored, but once it goes down, it's hard to keep down. It has a lot of horsepower, if you know what I'm saying. So I also gave it an ability that increased its move speed and another one that made it reflect spells. So it's basically just a juggernaut of the battlefield that's gonna be charging around and crippling everything that it comes across. The other thing about Kaiju is that each one of them is much more than just a giant monster. And while they very much are giant monsters, the key to creating an interesting and believable Kaiju is in their backstory and what their personality is like. Now their, actual, now their actual story of origin isn't super important as they're most likely to have existed long before the dragons and have been around for such a long time, it's unlikely there would be anyone living who would be able to know what their actual history is. 
Unless, of course, they're a recently born creature. But more so what I mean is the story of how their presence affects the world. What do people think about them? How are they treated? And how do they react to this treatment that they might receive from some mortal races across the world? And this brings us to our next topic. So let's talk about some... So possibly my favorite thing about Kaiju is that you can use them at any level. Doesn't matter what actual level your players are at, you can use Kaiju in your game. Now while a party of fledgling adventurers who are maybe levels 1, 2, or 3, or 5, or 10 would get absolutely annihilated in combat by a Kaiju, there are plenty of other ways to use these guys in your game. A monster of this scale will have a huge influence across all of their domain or whatever place it is that they call home. A classic way to have kaiju impact the adventure your players might be on is have your players find a village. Maybe it's out in the middle of nowhere where no one has heard of this giant monster that resides under the mountain or under the waves around the island or wherever it happens to be. If the players encounter that village of people who live with this creature nearby every day, they might encounter a group of people who worship it as a god. Now while the kaiju itself, you and I know, it's not an actual deity, to a small village that's out in the middle of nowhere, it might as well be. It's certainly more powerful than anything these people have ever seen and controls life and death before their very eyes, so... Sounds very godlike to me. The biggest thing to decide in that kind of situation is how is this kaiju worshipped? Is the kaiju a violent creature that the villagers worship out of fear? Maybe they offer ritual sacrifices to it and have wards set up all around their settlements because they're afraid of this thing. Anytime this creature starts to rampage or is spotted anywhere, everybody hides and feels that they must have done something wrong to anger this creature. And maybe the kaiju does in fact accept their sacrifices and doesn't kill them because of that. Or maybe the kaiju is completely indifferent to them and the villagers are simply projecting their fears onto it. To the kaiju, the villagers might just simply be like ants that it happens to destroy once in a while, but it doesn't really do it on purpose. It just doesn't even register them. But it's also possible for kaiju to play more of a positive role. Maybe the kaiju is a good guy and is worshipped as a benevolent protector. Perhaps this small fringe village that's out in the middle of nowhere in this land rich with resources has managed to survive because any time a rival kingdom or anyone has risen up against them to claim their home and desecrate the natural resources and forests around them, the kaiju who protects them comes to their aid and destroys everything that would come to this place. Now this might be because the kaiju genuinely feels it wants to protect these people for some reason decided by you, or it's also possible the kaiju is simply defending its home as well and it happens to share a home with this village, and maybe the villagers are respectful and aren't seen as so bad by the kaiju so it's happy to let them coexist. Perhaps there's even an island or some other kind of isolated area where there are two kaiju that constantly battle for dominance, and there are also two different peoples that are under the protection of said kaiju. So when the kaijus do battle, the peoples of these two villages or towns or kingdoms even do battle with one another in basically a war, neither side ever really being able to gain the upper hand. And this might be where your players come in if they choose to side with one place or the other. And yet another way to treat this monster is simply as a natural disaster. When a kingdom fears the wrath of the stormy seas or earthquakes that happen underfoot, that's one thing, but when those phenomena are caused by a kaiju, it's a completely different story. If you have a group of adventurers that basically are any level aside from 20, um, them being in a city while some kind of kaiju attack or cataclysmic event is happening is a set piece in and of itself. Of course the players won't interact directly with the kaiju charging, a monster like that would be absolute suicide. But maybe they're trying to pull off a heist or chasing down some kind of criminal and this chase scene is happening in the midst of a kaiju attack so they're trying to avoid panicked mobs and collapsing buildings while just trying to get to this target who's also doing the same. They would simply be trying to achieve their main objectives with this now crazy chaotic event happening so it becomes a set piece. The kaiju is still affecting the world, but not directly with the players, it's literally creating a backdrop for their adventure. Now while kaiju are immune to psychic effects such as being charmed, it might be possible that a powerful magic user or even a minor deity was able to get their hands on some kind of artifact that enabled them to take control of a kaiju. 
and a kaiju in the hands of someone else could be a devastating weapon. So while confronting the kaiju in melee combat would surely be absolute suicide, similar to the last situation, the party now has the objective of either taking down the person controlling the kaiju, or destroying the artifact that allows them this manner of control. So again, the kaiju serves a central role to this quest, but it's not something the players are ever meant to actually fight. It just serves as some sort of stake that if they fail, this person will use this kaiju for whatever evil ends they plan to use it for. It's basically the equivalent of stopping someone from launching a nuke at your kingdom, except the nuke has seven arms, tentacles, and 20 rows of teeth. Now eventually it is possible that your players might get to the point in their adventuring career where they could actually take a kaiju on head to head. In that type of situation, it will ensure a battle that your players will never forget. Surely the very landscape and countryside will bear the scars of such an epic confrontation. The battle between great heroes and the monster that would turn the realm to dust. The key with making a kaiju encounter, whether it's an actual combat encounter or otherwise interesting, it's all about the build-up. If you're familiar with older giant monster movies, or even some of the more recent ones, the highlight of the film is usually the climax where you see the kaiju in town destroying things or fighting against one of their other giant monsters in the movie. That scene is your money shot, but you don't want to just jump the gun and drop in this giant big bad monster on your players. While I'm sure it would be cool still, it lacks the buildup and therefore the payoff. Instead, leave small hints and clues about what this terrible creature might be. You just need to provide the framework, the legends, the general mythos about this creature, and the imagination of your players will fill in the rest. Like I said, maybe that small jungle village has protective runes etched everywhere, or perhaps the people don't speak because they're afraid that even saying any words will create too much noise and attract the attention of this monster. Just Little details, little carvings sketched into every person's home that depicts some kind of monster. Tiny things that will make your players say, what is that? Why is that? What's going on? They could even stumble upon an ancient archive and find a tome with pages torn out as if someone wanted to remove evidence of this ancient evil, and if they're able to either restore it or just look in different places, they might find some simple etchings or drawings of a very simplistic version of what the kaiju is. And of course, they could always hear legends and myths about these ancient beings that live in distant, faraway lands from old, decrepit sailors or half-crazed tavern patrons. However you choose to do this build-up and kind of lead to the kaiju's ultimate reveal, just be sure to keep in mind your kaiju's personality and, once again, how it affects the world around it. Because that is going to dictate what type of clues you will want to give to your players, and ultimately, when they finally do see this monster for the first time, they'll feel like they actually know it and understand it and realize why it's doing what it's doing, at least to some extent. All in all, a kaiju, whether a force for good, evil, or something in between, can be an absolutely amazing part of your D&D world. Even if it never actually makes an appearance, just this ancient myth or tale that is told from generation to generation, can be impactful enough and really provide an interesting piece of culture that you won't find anywhere else. And for that, I absolutely love them. So if you've ever had your DM drop a godlike monster on you, or you've been the one doing the monster dropping, definitely leave a comment below and tell us all about that. And definitely tell me about what kind of kaiju you plan on creating. What creatures are there that exist already that you want to twist and turn into these giant godlike monsters? Tell me their names and a little bit about them, and I really look forward to seeing what you guys do with this template. And as always, like I said, the stat block for the example kaiju and the template itself can be found in the description below in the form of a Google document. And if you are one of my lovely patrons, there is a more monster manual style kind of artistic version of the stat blocks slash templates that can be found on the Patreon page. I also want to give a big shout out to Artie Pavlov on Twitter for suggesting Kaiju and that particular issue of Dungeon Magazine because it ended up being awesome. So if you have any ideas for monsters you'd like to see on the show, definitely let me know on Twitter or in the comments below and I will be happy to take a look. Also, uh, two things. One, why am I in this weird room? Well, I'm in a hotel because for the past month I have been away traveling for work 
and as much as I was hoping to try and upload regularly, uh, this is the first video I've been able to put together. It also probably didn't help that I chose one of the most ambitious projects I've done in a while on this channel to do when I had much more limited time and I was away. But the good news is this weekend I will be traveling back home, so business should return to normal going into November and until the next weird thing happens in my life that makes creating YouTube videos more difficult. But until we get there, we will be back to our regularly scheduled programming as of next week. Just want to give a huge thanks to all you guys for sticking with me, even though I have been sucking at uploading and being around for the past little while. And especially to my patrons, I do apologize that this month was kind of light, but hopefully this giant stat block template situation kind of makes up for that a little bit. So. I do thank you guys so much for watching, I really do appreciate it, and I will see you in the next one back in my regular house. Until then, just like Godzilla, be cool.